in Bethlehem's town, the King of all kings from heaven came down. He was born of a virgin, as the prophets foretold. He came to this sin cursed I read a story recently how that an ancient king years ago passed away and his ambassadors were left to choose a successor. And it just so happened that this king that died, his wife, the queen, had just given birth to two twin sons. The ambassadors came and found these two little fellows fast asleep and they carefully agreed that it would be difficult to decide until uh, they noticed something. When they looked at these two little boys, one baby laid there with his fist closed tightly, the other asleep with his hands wide open. Instantly, the ambassadors made their selection. They chose the little boy who had his hands open and that little boy grew up to be known as the king with the open hand. Well, we could say the same thing about Christ, our king. He came to this earth with not only his hands open but his arms wide open and eventually 
He died on the cross, gave his life for our sins. Well, Jesus was born a king. And this was clearly revealed many years ago, even before he was born by the prophets. It was revealed at his birth by the angels. It was revealed at his death and after his resurrection and ascension in that sermon that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. And one day Jesus will return again the second time just as he came the first time. And when he does, he's going to return again as king. I want to tell you, Jesus was born for a purpose. In this series of messages, we studied how Jesus was born to conquer the grave. Then we studied how Jesus was born to be our Savior from sin. And then the third message, we studied and learned how Jesus was born to be our Emmanuel. And this morning, I want to bring you a message titled, Jesus was born to be our King. Do you believe that this morning? Jesus was born to be our King. And I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Luke's Gospel, chapter number 1. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 1. If you don't have a copy of the scriptures with you, feel free to follow along on our screens. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 1. And we'll begin reading with verse number 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Say that with me this morning, Jesus. Verse 32, he will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no End. In this passage of scripture, the angel Gabriel appears to Mary. Now, if you look back in Matthew's gospel, chapter 1, you'll find an angel appeared to Joseph. But Matthew doesn't identify that angel. It just simply says an angel. But Luke here identifies this angel and says it was Gabriel. And Gabriel appears to Mary and tells her that she is highly favored. She has been chosen by God, by God's grace, to give birth to the Messiah, to Jesus, to, son, to the Son of God. And then this angel reveals to Mary that this baby is born with a purpose. This baby is destined to be King of kings and Lord of of lords. So what exactly does this angel here tell us and tell Mary about Jesus being born as king? Well, I believe this text provides for us several dimensions pertaining to the kin's kingship of Christ. And as you and I listen and take note to this message this morning, I pray that each one of us will be moved to a greater allegiance and a greater adoration for Christ as King. First of all, the first dimension I notice in these two verses, 32 and 33, this angel reveals to Mary the greatness of his kingship. The greatness of his kingship. Did you notice in the first part of verse 32? The angel Gabriel tells Mary that King Jesus will be great. The Greek term for great here speaks of Christ 
being large in his nature, above average, above the standard. The term great here speaks of the loftiness and the distinguishment and illustrious nature of him as a person and him as a king. This statement clearly means that his name will be great, but also his true being, his nature will be great. The angel Gabriel is saying Jesus will be great in contrast with all of humanity that has been born or will be born. In Luke 1 and 15, the angel comes to Zacharias and says that John the Baptist will be great in the sight of the Lord. But here the angel Gabriel tells Mary that Christ will be great and doesn't give any qualifiers. In other words, he'll be absolutely great. Unqualified greatness here is ascribed to Jesus. In Matthew 12 and Verse 42, the Lord Jesus was speaking to a group of scribes and Pharisees and he says to them that a greater than even King Solomon was standing in their midst, speaking of himself. In the book of Hebrews, you can read how Christ is greater than the angels. He's greater than Moses. He was greater than Melchizedek. Also in that same book, Hebrews, the Bible tells us that Christ has provided for you and me a so great of a salvation. And since He has ascended into heaven as the mediator of the new covenant, which is greater than the old, He is also our great high priest. Throughout history, you can read of Ramesses II, the great, that Egyptian pharaoh famous for building a temple and enlarging Egypt's empire. You can read of Cyrus the Great, the founder of the Persian Empire, who let exiled peoples, including the Jews, return back to their native lands. You can read of Alexander the Great, the king of Macedonia and conqueror of the Persian Empire. You can read of Antiochus the Great, that Seleucid king of Syria. You can read of Herod the Great, that ruler in Palestine. You can read about Constantine the Great, that Roman emperor, and he made Christianity the state religion and improved the administration of his empire. There was Leo the Great, a pope from 440 A.D. and a saint who established the primacy of the church in Rome. There is Gregory the Great, that Roman individual who became pope and extended the area of the papal throughout Europe. There was Charlemagne the Great, king of the Franks and of the Holy Roman Empire. There was Alfred the Great, king of Wessex, who made peace with the Danes and introduced new law codes and programs of education. There's Otto the Great, the king of the Germans. There is Peter the Great, that czar from Russia. There is Frederick the Great. There was Catherine the Great, the Empress of Russia. You can go throughout history and you'll find men and women who have been ascribed that title of being great. But you know, I found that each one of those individuals, they were ascribed that title of being great by human beings. But the Lord Jesus Christ was ascribed that title of being great by Almighty God. He is a great king. Let me ask you this morning, who is great in your life? Is it some other person that's great? Could it even be yourself that you view as great? This morning, I want to challenge you to give Jesus Christ that place of preeminence in your life and view Him as the greatest of all. Secondly, I see another dimension about Christ being king, the greatness of his kingship. But secondly, I want you to notice the divinity of his kingship. 
In verse 32, this, Gabriel, this angel Gabriel tells Mary that King Jesus will be called the Son of the Highest. Now in Semitic thought, a son was viewed as a carbon copy of the Father. And in that culture, to refer to someone as a son implied that that person possessed the same qualities as their father. The term highest means the most high. In other words, King Jesus was the son, the only begotten son of the most high God. This here reminds us again that Jesus is no ordinary king. He is the God king. He's the carbon copy of the Most High God. He possesses the same nature as God the Father. Notice the angel tells Mary that her son will be called. Do you see that word called there? Called the Son of the Most High. That expression means that Christ will be recognized as such. And certainly this was the case. You can read over in Luke chapter 8 and verse 26 how that Jesus entered the country of the Gadarenes and immediately a demon-possessed man came up to him and started crying out, What have I to do with you, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? And there he was recognized even by the demons that he was God. You know, if the demons, if they recognize Jesus as God, then we should as well. Here the angel Gabriel is telling Mary that her son will be acknowledged and recognized, called the son of the Most High God. And this is not only a prophetic word about his life, his first advent, but it's also a prophetic word about his second advent when he returns again. Paul describes this in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, how that after Jesus ascended back to heaven after conquering death, hell, and the grave, the Father highly exalted him and gave him what? The name which is above every name. And at that name every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, of those even under the earth. And every tongue one day will also confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I'm telling you this morning we've got a king. He's king now. The devil knows he's king. Those who were before us know he was king. And brother, bless God, you better know that he's king as well. Jesus is king. I read a story how that a group of noblemen were gathered together in London. And they were waiting for the king of Britain to walk in. And these noblemen knew the king personally. Yet they all wanted to honor him as king, and so when he entered the room, these men stood solemnly up on their feet. The king walked in and said, Take your seat, gentlemen. I count you as my personal friends. And then jokingly he said to them, Gentlemen, I'm not the Lord, you know. And immediately one of the noblemen, a Christian man, said, No, sir, if you were the Lord, the King of kings, we would have not just stood to our feet, but we would have fallen down before you on our knees. You know, when it comes to King Jesus, He's not a mere man who deserves respect. He is the Son of the highest. You see, he not only deserves our respect, he deserves our allegiance. He deserves our love. He deserves our fear. He deserves our trust. And he deserves our worship now and for all eternity. Well, we see the divinity of his kingship. And then number two, I want to say something about the fulfillment of his kingship. Look in verse number 32, the latter part. 
This angel tells Mary that the Lord God will give this child that's about to be born, this child that she's carrying, he will one day inherit the throne of his father, David. This statement here lets Mary know that Jesus is going to be the royal Messiah, the one who has descended in the lineage of David. Now, we don't have in the genealogical records a lot about Mary, but we do with David, and we see his connection. But it's also obvious with this angel saying this to Mary that she was connected to the lineage of David as well. Here the Lord Jesus Christ being that long expected one, that long expected son of David, that long expected heir to that throne. In 2 Samuel, God promised David an eternal heir to his throne. We call that the Davidic covenant. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, Beginning at verse 12, the Lord said to David, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. Verse 13 says, He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. What? Forever. Then in verse 16, God said to David, And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. And so for many years, it was the hope of the Jewish people that one day a special king, an eternal king would come, would be born of the lineage of David to occupy this throne. Here the angel is saying Jesus is the one who's going to occupy this throne. Now you may be thinking, when did Jesus get this throne? When did Jesus fulfill that Davidic covenant? If you look over in Acts chapter chapter 2, you'll find that the apostle Peter told it to them on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter number 2, beginning at verse 29, Peter stood up and said, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ, what, to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. In Revelation 3 and 21, Jesus was speaking to the church of Laodicea. And he gave them a promise, and in that promise, he says, I have overcome, and I am now seated on the throne. So this message from the angel Gabriel to Mary was one of comfort, reminding her that God had remembered his covenant, that God had kept his word. You know, it's interesting if you type into Google a search of all the promises in the Old Testament about the first coming of Christ and how they were fulfilled. Many of them, uh, up into the hundreds of promises that were fulfilled about the first coming of Christ. And listen, folks, if Almighty God can keep His Word over something as serious as a promise like this, a son being an heir to the throne of David, how much more? Will he not keep his word about any other promise that he has made to you and me? 
We've got a God that keeps promises. And then number four, I see another dimension about the kingship of Christ. And that is the domain of His kingdom. Look with me at verse 33 now and notice that this angel told Mary that her son will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Notice the term reign there in our text. The term reign means to exercise authority, to rule. Now the phrase house of Jacob, look at that. He's going to reign over the house of Jacob. In the Old Testament, this term was used to describe Israel, the people of God. You can find that in Exodus 19, verse 3, Isaiah 2, 5 through 6, and others. But look with me. We're trying to understand who this house of Jacob is and how this is relevant to us today. Turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. I want you to look at this. This is key for understanding this. And see what the Apostle Paul and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit wrote down. In Romans chapter number 9, beginning at verse number 6, the Apostle Paul says... But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is those who are the children of the flesh. Those are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as seed. Now what's he talking about? He's talking about a different type of people being in the lineage of Abraham, being included in the descendants of Abraham. Look with me now. Turn over to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, beginning at verse number 26. Look at this. Galatians 3, beginning at verse 26. Paul writes... For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Do you see what these verses are saying? These verses are letting us know that you and I as believers in Christ today, we are spiritual descendants of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And as such, we've been brought in to the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of God. In other words, those who have repented and trusted in Christ as their Savior and Lord, they've been born into His kingdom. We are made partakers and members of His eternal kingdom. It's an eternal kingdom that was initiated at the birth of Christ. It was inaugurated at the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And it will be consummated fully at the second coming of Jesus Christ. You see here, folks, we have been included. He's head over His church. He's king right now. He establishes His gentle sway over the hearts of His people. He subdues us and rules and defends us and restrains and conquers all of His own and their enemies. I read a story about how the Spaniards one day were besieging the little town of St. Quentin on the frontiers of France. This little town was inhabited by a group of people called the Huguenots. The Spaniards had so surrounded this city that it was now in ruins, fever and famine had broken out 
and even treason existed among its population. One day, one of the Spaniards shot an arrow over the walls of this city, and on that arrow there was a piece of parchment promising these inhabitants if they would surrender their lives and their property to the king of France, their lives would be spared. The governor of that town, the great leader of the Huguenot people, he then took another piece of parchment and wrote something on it and then shot it back over the wall to the Spaniards. And when they received that arrow and that piece of parchment, this Huguenot leader wrote back, We have a king and his name is Jesus. You see, folks, we have a king. We're dual citizens. We're citizens of the United States of America, but we also have another citizenship. We are living in this world as citizens of this country that we are living in now, the United States, but we also are strangers and pilgrims headed to another country, another kingdom that we belong through faith in Christ. I want to ask you, have you been transferred by the power of the Holy Spirit into the kingdom of God? Have you been born into His kingdom? Do you have a king? Have you come under the rule of Jesus Christ? Are you living under His authority? And then I see a fifth dimension about the kingship of Christ in this text. And that is the eternality of His kingship. The eternality, look at the latter part of verse 33 with me. The angel Gabriel tells Mary that her son would be a king who would rule over the throne, over the house of Jacob, how long? Forever. And that his kingdom would never end. Notice that word forever in our text. It speaks of a long, extended period of time without any reference to an end whatsoever. The phrase, there will be no end, means no termination, no end in duration. One that lasts forever. In other words, the kingdom that Jesus Christ will inherit, that He rules and reigns over now, stands in contrast to David's kingdom. It was a temporal kingdom, a temporal reign. Then there was the kings that came through the lineage of David throughout the history of the Jewish people. One would live and reign and then die. Then another one would ascend to the throne, live and die. But Jesus Christ will live forever and His kingdom will endure forever. Christ And His kingdom will last forever. Isaiah 9 verse 7 says, Of the increase of His government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over His kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forevermore. In Daniel 7 verses 13 and 14, the Bible says, I was watching in the night visions. And behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days. And they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom the one which shall not pass be destroyed kingdoms have arose and kingdoms have fallen throughout history but there is a kingdom that has been established and friend it will last forever John the Baptist and Jesus and the disciples they preached what repent for the kingdom of God is at hand and you know this kingdom and its king was rejected by most of the Jewish people in the first century. They were looking for a political, a national king, one that would overthrow the Roman 
government. However, Jesus made it clear in John 18, 36 that His kingdom was not of this world. In Luke 17, 21, Jesus revealed that the kingdom of God is within you. It's within His believers now. It's a spiritual kingdom. That's where He's ruling and reigning right now. Paul explained in Romans 14, 17 that the atmosphere of this kingdom is one of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. This kingdom includes all those who have trusted in Christ by faith. It's a kingdom that is now but also not yet. Uh, this evil age right now, he's ruling and reigning in our hearts, but we know one day this kingdom will be realized and it will be expanded and will be known by faith when we see him coming in power and great glory one day. I love to think about the kingdom of Christ. Several years ago, you probably watched, like we did, a TV program called The Crown. How many of you watched that several years ago? In the first episode, you see King Edward VIII. And after the death of his father, he becomes king. And then shortly after, he abdicates the throne to marry a divorcee. Then in that program, his brother King George VI he becomes king and he reigned and led the people to victory in World War II. You know there in that show he develops lung cancer and eventually dies. And as the story goes his daughter Elizabeth becomes queen and she reigned for over 70 years. Nonetheless last year, September 2022, she passed away for someone else to take the throne. You see, the kings and queens of this world come and go. But there's one who's coming to reign, and he'll never go. He'll stand forever. An eternal kingdom. Are you going to be in that eternal kingdom? You see, it's an eternal kingdom that lasts forever. That means you and I are going to exist somewhere for all eternity. Will we exist in His kingdom or will we exist outside of His kingdom? That's the question. I read how that Queen Victoria, she one day was listening to a preacher preach and he started speaking of the second coming of Christ and how Jesus would return as king and the queen said later do you think Jesus could return anytime and the chaplain said yes and the queen said I'd love for him to return in my lifetime and the chaplain says oh why and she said because I'd like to lay my crown down at his feet I want to ask you folks this morning, have you laid the crown of your heart down at King Jesus? Have you surrendered to Him as King of your life? Have you crowned Him now, saying, Lord, Thine shall the glory be? Have you yielded allegiance to Him, recognizing that He's the only one that can save you? Have you yielded to His complete control and His rule and reign in your life? If you've not done that, I urge you to do that this morning. I ask each one of you to stand to your feet, every head bowed and every eye closed. Has God spoke to your heart this morning? Have you surrendered to Jesus as King of your life? He was born King. And you know whether we surrender to Him as King or not, He is King. And I've heard it said before that we'll either bow on this side of eternity and receive His salvation, or we'll bow on the other side if we refuse now in condemnation. Are we going to bow to King Jesus? I urge you to do that. If you need to be saved, I invite you to come. 
as we sing this morning. If you'd like for me to pray with you, I invite you to come this morning. Whatever it is on your heart in life, I urge you to yield to King Jesus. Let Him have His way in your heart, brother.